Good afternoon, everyone. Um, please take your seats in the afternoon session with the Witter Forum. You're welcome back again, and thanks to ADEC for perhaps making this happen. Uh, the gentleman who is right now here, back and forth, needs no introduction. <laughs> Name is Dr. Christian Kortman. He is uh, graduated in dental technology in 1995, and dentistry was at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil in 2002. He's a member and former president of the Brazilian Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry and a member of the European and American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry as well. He's a founder of the DST Digital Smile Design Company. He is the director of the DST Residency Program, providing country dental course done continuing dental education courses for dental professionals all over the world. He's one of the most renowned speakers in the international dental lecturing circuit and has published internationally in the fields of aesthetic and digital dentistry, oral rehab, innovation, uh, and innovation and trends, communication and marketing strategies in dentistry. With great honor and pleasure, I present to you Dr. Christian Koshman. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Always a pleasure to be here sharing, meeting some old friends, reconnecting my first lecture of the year, so starting the year in a very nice way. Thank you, Ritter Implants, for the opportunity, for the invitation. Always an honor to get to be invited and represent a company that is investing on education. So always a challenge to meet the expectations and to make your time worth it. So on this one hour that I have today, I'm going to talk about a topic that is very dear to my heart, the relationship between the dentist and the technician. Um, and despite all the amazing technologies that we see coming up in dentistry, this continues to be a big problem that very little people talk about. It's like technology will do the magic, and it won't. Communication between dentists and technicians is still very poor. There's no systems, very little protocols. Nobody talks about the communication process to be more efficient. We have mistakes done in the analog world and we continue to make almost the same mistakes in the digital world. There's a lot of back and forth, repetition, reduce, lack of consistency, outcomes that are not ideal, waste of time, waste of money, waste of materials. And I can say it from my own experience. As a dentist and as a technician, I learned from my own mistakes. 20 years on the bench working as a technician, but also doing the clinical work. I had a problem. I couldn't blame the technician. I was the technician. The same way as a technician, I couldn't blame the dentist because I was also a dentist. So every time I would make a mistake in the lab, I would suffer in the mouth. And every time I would make a mistake in the mouth, I would suffer in the lab. And it didn't matter how fancy my lectures were, how fancy the technology was, I was still suffering with the mistakes. And I decided that I wanted to try to change. Not because I wanted to lecture about it, but because I wanted to work with less stress. I wanted to stay less nights working in the lab. I wanted to have less mistakes at the last minute, like we always have. So I tried to start to think outside the box and ask myself what was going on. I was wasting time, wasting money, and not working with full pleasure all the time. And at the end of the day, of course, it didn't matter how good a ceramist I was, and I was pretty decent, and it didn't matter 
how good the dentists that I was working with, and I worked with some of the best dentists in the world, we were still suffering with the same mistakes. And because of that, affecting patient satisfaction. Exceeding expectations was an exception, not the routine. Even in the best dental practices in the world, this is still, unfortunately, the rule. We meet expectations most of the time, but sometimes we exceed expectations. Those moments when everything goes right and the patient is blown away and the case looks amazing and that full mouth rehabilitation just looks perfect. Is that the rule or the exception? It's the exception. Still today, 2024 is still the exception. That's why we celebrate, right? You know, when you open the box of the lab on that super important case, very tough patient, you really want the case to go well. You have like four hours scheduled to finish that long treatment. You're stressed, patient is stressed and tired. And for some reason, everything fits. The bite is perfect. The design is exactly what the patient wanted. Dental facial harmony is great. The appointment goes smooth. You bond the whole mouth in less time than you expected. You don't need to do more try-ins. You don't need to send back to the lab. First try-in, everything is perfect. Is this the exception or the rule? Is the exception. In 2024, with all the technologies that we have and the industry investing so much on giving us even better tools, this is still the exception because we are not maybe, perhaps, focusing on the core of the issues that we face. And for me, one of the most important factors that is harming the quality of our work is poor communication. We all talk about the importance of communication. It's almost like cliche, repetitive. Oh, it's important to communicate. It's important to work as a team, blah, blah, blah. What do we actually do for it? It's important to have a great relationship with our lab. So obvious. What do we actually do? to make it a professional communication system. We talk about steps, we talk about preps, we make beautiful preps, bite registrations, surgeries, implants, orthodontics, amazing biomechanics, and still suffer with communication. I see so many cases with amazing orthodontics, perfect biomechanics, and poor smile design, poor Oral facial harmony, amazing surgeries, amazing implants, 200 slides of perfect surgical procedures, and at the end, poor smile design, poor facial harmony. The same with prosthetics. We see those amazing lectures and perfect preps and impressions and bite registrations and function and occlusion, poor smile design, poor outcomes. That's one of the main reasons why we here on stage, many times we don't show the real outcome of our cases. We skip that slide. Who never did that as a speaker? Many times we don't show the picture of the patient's face smiling with the final outcome of our own work. Who never did that as a speaker? 200 slides of the surgery, very proud of it. Feeling very cool on stage. But the final facial integration, oh, better not to show that slide. Oh, the patient has a low lip line. He's fine. So after 25 years working as a dentist technician, this is the summary of my major pain points. Not only working on my cases, but visiting dozens of, lab, of clinics all over the world. And nowadays, as the owner of a big digital lab, working with hundreds of 
practices and clinicians all over the world. Number one, inconsistent and or incomplete initial documentation. Can you believe that in the 21st century, actually one quarter of the century is gone, majority of cases going into labs still don't have ideal documentation. Dentists are still not standardizing the documentation that they send to labs. Example, still today, many cases don't have enough facial information to allow the technician to do a facially driven smile design. How can that happen? How can we expect a smile to be in harmony with the face? Because that's the only way to have an ideal outcome, facial harmony. By the way, we learned that modern dentistry is facially driven, facially generated treatment planning. What does that mean? That we need to start from a facially driven diagnostic wax up, digital or analog, I don't care. Start with the face and 80% of the cases going into labs don't have enough ideal facial information. So we are expecting for what? Magic. The consequence, of course, most of the cases that we deliver in dentistry don't have dental facial harmony. It's what I call the model cases. They look very nice in the model. We take pictures of the case of the ceramics in the model. We put it in the mouth. We look at the face. Oh. Those type of patients that we bond the case and we meet them by chance on the supermarket after three, six months, we look at them walking towards us and be like, mm, that was me, not nice. We can see it on Facebook, the amount of cases on Instagram where the after is worse than the before. Disaster. There's a disconnect between mock-ups, provisionals and final restorations. People don't use systems to communicate the steps, dentists and labs. That's why many times the dentist does a good job with the provisional and asks the lab to replicate the provisional on the final restoration. Whoever asked your lab to copy your provisional? Dear lab, my provisional was approved by the patient. Please copy the provisional. The case comes back next week. You try it in and it doesn't look like the provisional. Whoever have a, that situation happening. It's very common. Do we stop to rethink the process or do we just blame the technician? What do we do to change this reality? Because still today, that happens every other week with dentists from all over the world. No connection between the stages of the project. Of course, waste of time, too much intraoral adjustments. Imagine that we could sum the amount of hours that you waste of your precious time every year adjusting things in the patient's mouth. I guess that is probably like three months of paid vacation for you, wasted in the trash, adjusting things in the mouth. Because the case came back, it was too long or too short, too wide, too narrow, emergence profile was not ideal, pontic design was not ideal, Emergence profile was not ideal. Contact points were not ideal. Bite was not ideal. Soft tissue conditioning was not ideal. So many aesthetic parameters that we are adjusting in the mouth. We dentists, we transform the patient's mouth into our laboratory. We try in things and we adjust things in the mouth that makes no sense. The question is, what can we do outside the mouth to save time in the mouth. Does it make sense to waste 30 minutes adjusting an incisal edge in the mouth because it's too long? Or is there something else that we can do to detect the ideal incisal edge beforehand and get our cases with the perfect incisal edge every time? We don't talk about it. Unnatural outcomes, this is the rule. We see it on Instagram as well. Smile rehabilitations look fake. That's the rule, not the exception. How do we reconnect with nature? How do we create rehabilitations that actually look natural? How do we communicate better, dentists and technicians, to design natural looking smiles? 
the amount of back and forth. On big cases, we never say that the final try-in appointment is the final appointment. That's why we call it try-in and we tell the patient. Because usually when we try in a big case, we know that it's probably going to go back to the lab to do something, to come back, and sometimes it's back and forth three times, four times. Is that smart? Can we do something about it? What are the systems that we have in place to reduce the back and forth? Very hard to see systems to express the improvements. When you try a big case, and you see things that you want to improve, what is the system that you use to communicate to your lab the improvements, the changes, the modifications? Do you use a system? Or you just call your lab and you try to explain it on the phone or you write on the slip? It makes no sense to communicate dentistry with words on the phone or on a paper on the 21st century makes no sense. So is smile design under control? The answer is no. Surgeries are much more under control. Ortho, preps, bite registrations are much more under control than the simple starting point of modern dentistry, where the teeth belong in the face, and how to communicate that to the lab and how to get that back exactly the way we need. That's what we need to focus on. Clinical procedures are much more under control than the actual process of delivering natural smiles. So look what we did. Say, so let's professionalize this. Let's learn from project managers, you know, big companies. We complain as dentists and technicians that we need to handle five employees, 10 employees maybe. That is a mess, the back and forth, etc. How can we complain if there are people out there running companies with 20,000 people doing things that are much more complex and delivering consistency? We need to be open. We need to learn beyond dentistry, project management, creating systems. We didn't learn that in dental school. How to create a system to work less and make more money. How to create a system to minimize problems. So look at this. A simple smile rehabilitation case. I sat down and I wrote down all the major steps to change the patient's smiles. And it comes down to us into 18 steps. There's 18 steps to change somebody's mouth. 18 moments that can go wrong. 18 moments that we can miss the communication. 18 moments where we have no systems to make it standardized. Some of the moments are done by the dentist. Some of the moments are done by the technician, of course. So let's go quickly just to see our thinking process. Moment number one, data collection, pretty obvious, right? Your first appointment, everything that you need to do to standardize the information with quality and efficiency. Number two, how do you transfer this information without wasting time so your lab can develop a facially driven diagnostic design or wax up, whatever name you want to give. The starting point, of modern dentistry. That's step number two. Step number three, after you take care of the dental facial aesthetics, how do you move into function to analyze, to diagnose, to treatment plan based on the diagnostic wax up still in the lab? Then, based on this diagnostic wax up, step number four, build your treatment plan facially driven, smile design driven, modern, comprehensive interdisciplinary treatment planning. Number five, how do you translate this beautiful plan into a presentation for the patient? And number six, how do you onboard the patient? Case acceptance, education, motivation, selling the treatment. So now case acceptance happens, so the treatment starts. Next step, what we call 
complementary preparatory procedures. If the case needs some crown lengthening or some grafting or some implants or some ortho, everything is there. Step number seven, guided by the waxer. Step number eight, very, very important. After you did the ortho or the perio or the implants or changing the vertical or whatever you had to do before restorative, once this is done and healed, this documentation needs to be repeated. This is a moment we need to redo full documentation, post-ortho, for example. Back to the lab, why? Because now the lab needs to adapt the diagnostic wax up after all the procedures before restorative. So it's the adapted wax up. Number nine, the lab needs to guide the dentist with the preps. Dentists don't do the preps to the lab. The lab needs to guide the dentist on the prep. Number 10, with that information coming from your lab, only then you prep the teeth. Prep by design. Not more than necessary, not less than necessary, just exactly. Based on what? The diagnostic design from the lab. Number 11, information goes back to the lab and for the third time, the lab needs to go back to the diagnostic wax up and adapt again. To what? To your prep. Now, step number 12. The lab needs to validate your prep. The lab needs to see your margins, otherwise, no way to proceed. <clears throat> Still today, another amazing piece of information. Two-thirds of cases coming from dentists to labs shouldn't be accepted by the lab. I'm going to repeat. Two-thirds of cases going from dentists to labs, the lab should say, Doctor, I'm sorry, we cannot proceed. Because preps or impressions or bite registrations are not good enough. Two-thirds. Is there a problem there? Or we pretend we are not seeing it? So we need a system to identify, to allow the dentist to see what risks they want to take. Number 13, only now the lab is going to design the restoration itself after approving the preps. Number 14, finally, manufacturing and finishing. Pretty obvious. Number 15, back to the dentist, the system for trying. There is a system for trying. There is a very smart system for trying what order, what sequence, what to look, how to make notes of it, how to identify the issues, to be able, when necessary, to go back and communicate the modifications. There's a system to communicate the modifications. Modifications are done back to the practice and the final outcome is placed. There's a system to communicate the final outcome. And finally, the patient goes into maintenance. 18 steps for a simple 10 veneer case. Now, when you look at this, you may think, oh my God, this is overwhelming. It may look overwhelming at the beginning, but I can tell you, every time you build a system and you repeat, 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 you can only get benefits out of it. Once this becomes a routine, your life is much easier. So, having a better life as a dentist, delivering better standards, depends on implementing systems. As I said, we didn't learn in dental school. Now, to make it a little bit more Complex. Not only we have 18 steps, but we started to develop the communication system in between the steps because that's what matters. As I said, 
We are very good performing the 18 steps. We are very bad communicating from one step to the other. That's the problem. So we have many courses teaching us how to do each one of these things separately very well. The problem is the system. That's why the validation moments, as we call, became the key for us. Some validation will come from the dentist to the technician. And some validation will come from the technician to the dentist. Means when the dentist does a key step, the technician needs to approve it. And when the technician does a key step, the dentist needs to approve it before we waste time, before we ship the case, before we schedule the patient. The validation moment for me is the key to implement a quality system in a dental practice, not only for restorative cases. Validation means even if you work alone, you need to validate with yourself. You need to validate internally. It's like a quality control. If you talk to an engineer, they will tell you. If you talk to a smart business person, they will tell you. So the validation consists of identifying the key moments of your work where you are maybe making mistakes that are harming your work. You identify these moments and you tell yourself, first, when I perform this procedure, I need to create a system to document what I just did. Every time, every day, for every patient. Then, I need to develop a system to communicate what I just did. Pretend you have a supervisor. Pretend you have a boss. Pretend you have a quality controller, even if the quality controller is yourself. You need to look over your work following the same system. So, if you're doing a prep and you want another dentist to look at your prep, what is the minimum information you need to share so they can give the feedback without wasting time? That's the thinking process. Are you going to take like 200 pictures and put it on a Dropbox folder and share with your friend? They're not going to see it too much. It needs to be super fast and efficient just enough. Then you need to create a system for the person to evaluate your procedure. And then you need to create a system for the person to communicate back. Approved, not approved, these are the improvements, this is what you need to do. For example, if you get a work from your lab, if you get an abutment from your lab and the abutment profile is too aggressive and is harming the gum, too much pressure. The lab needs to be able to document that first. Then the lab needs to generate some images to communicate and you get on the phone the design before they even manufacture because you don't want to waste their time and their money and the materials. Then you're going to evaluate that and then you need to communicate back. This is not good. You need to change X, Y, Z. What do you do? You do some print screens, you do a little video, you take a photo, you draw with your fingers. What is the protocol for you to communicate back to your lab every time the submergence profile of your abutment is not the way you want? Because if you call in the phone angry, they will not memorize, they will not learn, and they will repeat the problem. So it looks complicated, but it's not. It's pretty obvious. You document what you did, you communicate what you did, somebody evaluates, and somebody communicates back. Every single step needs a validation the key steps. So there's three answers for these key steps. Approved, let's proceed. Not approved, improve or repeat. Not ideal, but good enough. We can proceed, but let's not miss the opportunity to learn and do better next time. That's number three. Every step that we do in life has these three answers. We create a system for that. It's not randomly, it's not casual. It's not on the phone. It's documented. It wastes very little of our time. So we start with data acquisition. 
Let's leverage technology. If data acquisition is a real problem, and it is a real problem, let's simplify. Let's standardize. Let's start on the right way. So, of course, that nowadays we don't do models anymore. We don't do impressions. This is already huge improvement. Look at that. Look at the amount of distortion and mistakes that we used to do in the analog world compared to what we do today. The same thing with the byte. Look at the amount of errors, distortions and mistakes that we used to do in the past and how the digital workflow is helping us improve the transfer of information. So for us, it's very simple. We need five smartphone pictures, one smartphone video, intraoral scans, upper, lower and the byte. We need a CBCT when necessary and we send this to the lab. That's it. It can't get more simple than that. You have everything you need for the lab to create the patient's avatar and start working on the case. Not more, not less. The lab needs to know how to overlap the information to create this 3D patient, the virtual patient, and the lab needs to know how to reverse engineer the face into the smile design and help your treatment plan the case. Not only we don't do more analog working models, diagnostic models, we don't do more working models as well. So everything can be scanned. And we can avoid all these problems. It doesn't matter if it's a big case, small case, we all know scanners can do it all. Probably the only case that we cannot scan are the big edentulous cases with not enough keratinized tissue where we do need the end of the vestibules to then generate a removable denture. That's the situation that we still need to do a high-end, old-school, customized soft tissue impression because the impression here is not only working as an impression, the impression is working as a soft tissue conditioner, moving the tissue to capture the information. So we need to do that and then we can scan it back to the digital world. And of course, here all the advantages of being able to prep and scan digitally and communicate with the lab faster while the patient is still in the chair. Identify problems on your scanner, connect your scanner to your lab. Everything that you see on the scanner, your lab should be seeing through your scanner. And you're going to avoid a lot of mistakes. Immediately fix them, generate better information for the lab. Another very important topic that we don't talk enough, and I have the pleasure to be speaking about this in front of the two guys that helped me develop these ideas, the Anini brothers. I don't know if you guys lectured about this this morning, but it's not only about telling the lab where the teeth are, but also where the gum is. We don't talk about that. The regular impression or the regular scan doesn't give us delicate information to allow the lab to make less mistakes. How many cases do you try in and have black triangles, for example? Or how many cases do you try in there's too much pressure on the gum? How many cases that you waste a lot of time to build beautiful provisionals that are touching the tissue perfectly and you want the lab to copy that? So I break down the pink information, the gingival information into five components, what I call the submergence profile, different than the emergence profile. The submergence profile is the yellow part that you only see on implant restorations, is the deep part. The emergence profile, the pink, is the same for implants and teeth on slightly subgingival preps. So you want to capture that information and you want to allow the lab to design ideal submergence profile. So we need to start scanning the devices outside the mouth. Like for example, here you see the provisional scanned by the Anini brothers. You see how the lab was able to copy that on the restoration. 
And then you see the emergence profile. The emergence profile is very, very, very little and delicate, but it can mess up the whole case. Just that little bit. So we want as well to communicate that in a good way to waste less time afterwards. So that's the emergence profile. And you can also scan your provisionals. If you did a great job with the provisionals on this topic and have the lab copy paste that information. Then you have the Pontic and Gingiva interface. You need to also transfer this information. If it's pre-op, if it's a provisional, or if it's a try-in of the finals, whatever you did. If you need to modify and you want to add some flow or you want to trim it down a little bit, once you do that, you need to transfer that, copy-paste into the lab. So there's no guessing. So we need to start scanning the devices outside the mouth, the provisionals, the restorations. If you have two central crowns and there's a black triangle, and you go with your flow and you add and you put it and it's perfect now, what do you do? You scan that, send it back, and the lab can copy paste and redo that exactly the way you want. So there's no guessing. So you see here, scanning provisionals should become a routine if the information on the provisional is a good reference. So you need to scan the provisional in the mouth because it gives a lot of information, but you need to scan the provisional outside the mouth as well. If the emergence, submergence, and pontic information is good on the provisional. So you see how the digital information can be copy-paste into the final prosthesis. The interproximal, as I said, if you change it, if you improve it, you scan it. And the margins, deep margins, if you rely on your provisional and your provisional is very well fitting, you can scan that information as well to complement the scan of the preps. So this is all explained in an article that shows the different workflows for teeth and for implants and the pieces of the puzzle that we need to digitalize to send to our lab and give the lab the possibility of designing a restoration that you're gonna have to adjust less in the mouth. That's the goal. And in the lab, we can overlap all these pieces of the puzzle and select the pieces that are better information and design the final restoration with the best of each piece. For me, one of the key concepts to transform communication is asynchronous communication. What is that? It means that when you look at this slide, you are overwhelmed and you should, and you think to yourself, if I have 20 new patients per month, how can I do this 20 times per month? Because every patient deserves this. So the main word is efficiency, and efficiency on communication means that we cannot communicate the way we are used to phone calls and Zoom calls and in-person meetings, you cannot replicate 20, 30 times per month, several times per case. So what is the solution to improve quality of work through better communication in a way that you can do it for every patient? Because it's not only you and the lab, you need to bring your orthodontist, your periodontist, your surgeon, Whoever is going to help you make better decisions. How can you make better decisions empowered by better communication for every single patient, every single time? And the answer is team asynchronous visual communication. It needs to be asynchronous and it needs to be visual. What is the meaning of asynchronous? It means that you can communicate as a team without having to be on the same place, neither available at the same time. Meaning the problem is that even if you work under the same roof, in the same clinic, when you have five minutes free, the other person doesn't have the same five minutes free at the same time. That's the problem. So the communication needs to be asynchronously happening and visual because it makes no sense to communicate dentistry without images. No sense. How can you explain an ortho-tooth movement through words? It's insane. 
since we have software and we have images that we can just move the teeth, do two print screens and give to the other person and say, this is what I want. Do I need words? So visual communication is essential. So we need to incorporate this as a routine. Synchronous communication doesn't help us. It's nice on the picture. It's not realistic. So phone calls, Zoom calls, in-person meetings will not solve the problem. So we need to develop a system where we can communicate as a team and solve 90% of our problems asynchronously. So how do you communicate with your lab? Synchronously or asynchronously? I can tell you 90% of the dentists are still communicating synchronously. Explaining problems synchronously, finding solutions synchronously. This is not replicable. So we need to digitalize our patients. We need to use cloud sharing systems and group chat platforms to be able to do asynchronous communication. And then we need to transform our phones into content generators, images. You need to transform your phone into the third eye of your technician. And your technician needs to transform their phone into your third eye. And this needs to become a system, a protocol. Always the same. In every situation, we have specific images that need to be done to show to the other what is going on without wasting time. That's the magic. Look how our daily work looks. This is how we as a lab are able to communicate with 1,000 dentists from all over the world in a much better quality than when I used to work inside my dad's practice. There's no comparison. Asynchronous is the way, and you can start to master the process of doing print screens of computers, images of the procedures, and express yourself as if you were giving a mini lecture. Every time there is an issue, you need to pretend you're giving a lecture about it. You need to capture the images and write the notes in a way that the other person can fix it. So your technician needs to master the process of doing print screens of everything that they are doing. And the only way for that to happen is that we standardize that. Otherwise, the lab will go crazy. Every time we are doing an upper wax up, these are the images. Upper and lower wax up, these are the images. Abutment design, these are the images. Final restorations, these are the images. So you create yourself the most common procedures you have at your lab and you translate into imaging systems. So the lab is gonna do print screens and screen recordings. You're gonna do print screens and screen recordings and you're gonna share that in a group chat with everybody that is important to make better decisions. And suddenly, decision-making will become much better, much faster, much more efficient, and less mistakes in the mouth. And it's amazing. The solutions are already there. You can have all of this in your phone. You can see this on your phone if you have a lab that understands the comp concept of asynchronous visual communication. You need, to master of draw, you need to master the process of drawing with your fingers. Expressing the issues with your periodontist, orthodontist, and your lab. Anticipating the problems as a protocol. Not casually, not sometimes. Every time, always the same. So the phone becomes your biggest partner. Your number one ally to improve decision-making and waste less time. Softwares are already understanding. Companies are learning this and starting to simplify the process to allow you to communicate visually and chat as a group to talk about your cases without wasting time. It's like combining, imagine you could combine Dropbox, WhatsApp, and ExoCAD. That's what is happening and that's what we are doing. Everything is visual. Everything is asynchronous. Everything is team communication. The diagnostic design. Start with the end in mind. So you need to be able to guide your technician 
to develop the design in an ideal way. As I said, every case you do with your lab, there are five major moments that you need to communicate better. What we call the facially driven design, the functional design, the treatment planning simulations, the adapted design after the preparatory procedures, and the final restoration itself. Look if you agree with me. So, this is the solution that I'm suggesting to you on everything that you need to do to diagnose, design, and plan with your lab better. This is the minimal information that they need to do and print screens that they need to share with you. So you can be in vacation on the other side of the world, look at these images in 10 seconds and say yes, no, repeat, redo, adjust. So when you get back from vacation, the case is there exactly the way you want. So when we ask a diagnostic design to our lab, these are the images that the lab needs to send back to you before they send you the case, before you approve the case. You need to approve these images on the phone. When you order a diagnostic functional design, upper and lower wax up, these are the images that you need to check the case. Not more, not less. After you approve the diagnostic design, when you're treatment planning the case, these are the images that the lab needs to share with you for you to finish the treatment planning. Define, are you gonna do your ortho, yes or no? Are you gonna do implants, yes or no? How many, where? Are you going to crown lengthen? Yes or no. Are you changing the vertical dimension? Yes or no. You need these images to help you make better decisions. And the final part, the restoration itself. This is very practical information and I think very good tips for dentist lab communication. As I said, always tell your lab, Every case you receive from me, don't move forward before you send me this quick video on my phone and I approve the margins that you delimited for me. Until you can use a software where you, dentist, can put the margins before you send the case, you need this. This is mandatory. It makes no sense for a lab to design a restoration before you see this video. You cannot imagine the percentage of cases where the dentist is looking at this video and saying, no, the margin is not there, it's there. So then you pause the video, what do you do? You zoom in, you do print screens. Who knows how to do a print screen on the phone? You do a print screen and you draw with your fingers where the margin should be and you solve the problem and you will never, ever, ever again have a restoration that is too short. Have you ever called your lab saying the restoration is short? I'm 100% sure yes. You solve the problem, you communicate, and the lab goes there and fix it before they design the restoration. So that the restoration is exactly where it should be. Now, if I'm a lab, I'm the one gonna make it mandatory because I don't want never, ever, ever again a dentist blaming me for the restoration being short. Because from now on, I'm gonna say, doctor, you positioned the margin, not me. Restoration design. Mandatory, every time a lab designs a restoration for you, they need to do these print screens and send on your phone. Don't manufacture anything before you look at these images. You cannot imagine the amount of details that you're gonna see here and you're gonna ask for improvement and you're gonna save so much time. The lab can do overlapping. For example, look at the transparency. One design against the other design. Doctor, which one is better? One is the initial design and the other one is your provisional. They're slightly different. Which one do you want? I don't want to waste my time. So easy, these images. They're mandatory and they're standardized. The lab doesn't need to think. Every case is the same. Even if everything is perfect, the print screens are done and shared with the dentist for every single case. You see on the group chat. And you see, this is real world. This is how we communicate. Now, the lab also need to start quality controlling their own work through drawings. This is my supervised ceramist supervising the work of my other technicians 
through drawings, print screen, drawing, print screen, drawing. Don't try to explain with words, explain with drawings. You don't waste your time. And that's what we do with the dentist. The dentist gets these drawings on the phone. Another very good trick, tell your technician, don't only give me print screens. After manufacturing, even if I already approved the design, I want to approve the manufacturing before you ship it. Never allow your lab to ship a case to you before they do a video of the case and allow you to approve the video. It takes one second and you're gonna save you so much time. Because even though we approve the digital design, there's difference here on the video. And why do we do a video instead of photos? We do the photos as well, but the video is mandatory because you can see things on the video that you don't see on the photos. Many times the photos look great, but you look at the case on real life and it doesn't look that great. The video is much more realistic. Take a phone, create a video, 180 degrees, top, bottom, it takes five seconds, send to the dentist. Doctor, please approve before we ship. And then there's the doctor giving us the insights of what needs to improve. So we have the photos and we have the video. This is the protocol that your lab should use. One video and five photos and that's all you need to save a lot of time and a lot of problems. We take the photos on the dies so the dentist can see the fit and ask for improvements before we ship the case, and then all the comments, as I said, everything is documented. If the doctor calls us and say, I don't like this, I don't like that, I said, doctor, please hang up, write it down, print screens, write it down, and send it to us asynchronously. Don't call me these things because I cannot memorize and I cannot understand. If you don't like the embrasures, if you don't like the line angles, if you don't like the emergence profile, print screens and drawings, and you're gonna save a lot of time. I can be here showing these things for days. That's how we work. If one side is different than the other side, everything is visual communication. If you like it, if you don't like it, this is how we work. And certain steps are mandatory. So summarizing, what are the key moments? The moments that we make more mistakes, the nightmare moments, Moment number one is what we call the pre-prep. For us in the lab is mandatory. We don't do ceramics for dentists that don't upload the case to us before prepping. I'm gonna repeat, before prepping. If you want to make your life better, if you want to improve your dentistry, never, ever, ever prep teeth before planning the case with your lab. Don't prep and send. Plan the case with your lab before. What are the things that you need to plan with your lab before you touch their teeth? Functional analysis, your lab can help with that because functional analysis impacts what? Prep design. Don't prep teeth before discussing function with your lab. Two, the technique, the color, and the material. Never ever prep teeth before discussing with your lab. What is the color now? What is the color after? What is the material that we're gonna use? What is the technique? What is the type of restoration? Define and share the commitment with your lab. Share the responsibilities. Make the lab accountable. Number three thing that you need to plan with your lab before prepping. The prep design itself. The lab needs to tell you, doctor, please break this contact. Doctor, please go subgingival here. Doctor, please give me a little bit more clearance there. Doctor, please wrap around this one. Don't need to wrap around that one. Please include the bicuspids. No need to include the bicuspids. Don't miss the opportunity to learn from your lab. They're gonna be the ones doing the restorations. It makes no sense to do these procedures without talking to the lab. Number four, provisional strategy. Experienced technicians have a lot of experience with provisionalization and they give, give you a lot of insights that is connected to the design and connected to the prep. And pink management, gingiva, 
This interferes with the prep as well. If there's a soft tissue defect, if there is a concavity, if there is a pontic, if there is a recession, if there is a possible black triangle, all these pink aesthetic issues need to be analyzed before prepping because the prep may change because of it. The prep may be the salvation of the case if we analyze this beforehand with the help of our lab. Why the lab? Because the lab has everything in 3D. Design in the software with the tissues, with the implants, with everything. Then the second moment that you need to leverage your lab, guided prep, meaning whenever the plan is done, you need your lab to help you plan the preps and manufacture the guides so you can do guided preparation. Then you need to master the documentation of the preps and the gum. And then post prep is the summary of what I just said. Number four, allow, empower your lab. Please feel free to criticize my preps. Who does that with your lab? Please say whatever, don't be afraid. Look at my preps on the computer and tell me everything. I'm not saying that I'm going to repeat everything. I'm saying I'm going to learn from everything. So allow your lab to evaluate clearance, path of insertion, finishing line, sharp angles, scan mesh quality. Then after they approve the prep, they need to approve the diagnostic design over the prep. Then they need to approve the margins with the videos share with you. Then you need to approve their design before manufacturing. And then you need to approve the manufacturing before the shipping. This is the summary. This is the recipe for happiness in restorative dentistry. Everything else we are doing pretty well. The clinical procedures are mainly under control. We don't talk about this. This is where the magic lies. Consistency. Systems. So look at these eight moments and ask yourself, do I have a system for this? And if I don't, I'm going to make one. And when I make one, I'm going to have the discipline to use it every time the same way. I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to use the system. So conclusions. You need visual asynchronous communication. You need to identify the key moments and you need to transform them into mandatory communication systems. For that, you need to empower your phone. You need to empower your assistants and your lab to always use the phone to capture the problems, translate the problems. You need, of course, screens. The lab, you can only work with the lab that has a screen and technicians that are used to working visually guided technicians. And you need to have screens on every important place on your practice where you can make decisions based on images. Never make a dental decision without images. It makes no sense. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. It makes no sense. Conclusions. Today, we have poor communication. It's a chronic problem in dentistry. Impacts quality, harms efficiency, generates frustration and stress. Nobody talks about it. Great communication doesn't happen by chance. It's not blah, blah, blah. It's not coming on stage and saying communication is important. And so what? You need a proactive attitude to implement systems. Great communication depends on actively implementing replicable. A great idea that you cannot use for every patient is not a great idea. Replicable. Efficient communication is strongly empowered by technology, visual and asynchronous communication. Depends on routine and discipline because we are used to the old way, so we tend to cheat our own system. 
The modern lab should become the communication technological and planning hub. So find the lab that is up for the challenge. Write down the steps of your most important procedures. Define which steps are done by the clinical and which ones by the lab. Identify which steps are causing you more problems. Make the systems mandatory for at least these problematic steps. Create a standardized communication process. How? Define how ideally and visually communicate what you did or somebody else did. Define who will validate what was done. Define how to ideally and visually communicate the conclusions of the validation and then be a leader. Bring your team on board and explain them why this is vital in a way that they're going to believe it and want to do it. Because if the team is not on board, it's not going to happen. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very for staying on time. Wonderful lecture. Thanks a lot. Luke, you have certificate. Just want to give a certificate of appreciation to a Christian for a wonderful lecture. If you have questions, keep them to yourself. <laughs> sorry. That's a good oh, sorry. You, I, I, well, you, can, you can ask whenever you want to. <laughs> but <we> okay. <laughs> sorry. That was, that was, that was good. <laughs>